The markets area of Dublin has a rich history going back over 900 years. A place where the past and present continually collide. Never has this been more so than in the recent past. The years of the so-called Celtic Tiger have left their mark on this part of Dublin's northwest inner city. The initial idea to make this film came from people who live and work in the markets area. The aim of the project is to celebrate life and the rich traditions of markets and street trading at a time of change and transition for people in the area. I was born in 25A Smithfield and I remember the early shelters being knocked down in Smithfield and big crying, there were big balls swinging in and knocked them all down. And that's the earliest I can remember. My mother and father met around the corner, not far from here, in Birdsville Street. That's where my mother lived in number 40, Birdsville Street. She met my father, he was from Tamlick Street. I mean, there was, there was nine of us living in 7A Ormond Square because my grandfather and grandmother lived with us and then there was five kids, my mother and, mother and father. So uh, it was fairly cramped. Uh, Tony Gregory came up one day and he said, there's a flat and reed tree for you. I was delighted. It was on the bottom. It was a lovely flat. It was facing George Street. And he said, there's a flat and reed tree. Oh, I was delighted. Well, I grew up around the corner here in Logan Street. And then we moved up to Linden Hall Street. It was only a few metres or a few yards up the road and I'm still there at the moment. You know, being city centre, when you had to leave it. The streetscape was rather narrow, it was dull, it was miserable. Uh, right where you're sitting now, it was a very narrow area. There was um, a scrap stores across the way there, there was Kennedy's Dairy up the way. Where our actual flats are now, Queen Street flats, and the house is based in Queen Street. Both of them, all around their area, Black Hawk Parade, they were all tenement houses all along the five where the new apartments is. Every, all that area is totally covered tenant houses. She used to live in Ch Chancery Street, it was called Pillane then, and when they were knocking down the tenement houses, they moved her over to Wood Quay. And that's where her mother and mum moved over to. So when they built the houses in Norman Square, she got the very corner house. I was four year old at that time, nearly four, and we were living in Chapel Alley. My mother anyway was offered a flat or a house out there for either Cabra or Greek Street. At the time, Mother thought Cabra was in the country, which is only up the road, so my mother said, no, she take Greek Street flats. So that's when we moved over there. The most well-known market in the area is the wholesale fruit and vegetable market on Mary's Lane. It was opened alongside the now demolished fish market a little over 100 years ago by Dublin Corporation. The reason for this was to regulate the large and often unsanitary markets that had existed in the area for centuries. The presence of these in earlier markets is the reason for the strong local tradition of street trading and the close links with Moore Street, less than a mile away. Street trading in Dublin is regulated by the City Council and there are three main types of traders in the area. The Moore Street traders who work year round on fixed pitches, Christmas Street traders who work in Henry Street in December, and casual traders who work in various places from Capel Street to O'Connell Street. Both the fruit and vegetable market and Moore Street now face an uncertain future at a time of stalled development and renewed recession. There was an awful lot of the people around the area that were involved with the markets or involved with street trading. Like that was just normal to see people doing that. That was part of the way they made a living. And that's the way we grew up. My ma used to buy the stuff for me. And I went, I used to go down the market when I was young, but not to buy. My ma was the buyer. I used to sell, help me ma. But then I got my own stall. Well, she was a dealer in the market. She done the fruit and the veg and the fish. Uh, she was left a widow very young. I think she was only 42 years of age. And she had eight children to rear. My mum was a street trader. She used to go down to the markets there around at George Cell School and she'd buy our bits of fruit and that and go down and sell them in Henry Street on the pram. 
street trade and selling fruit and veg and that sort of thing was uh, widespread across Tinner City uh, back in the 50s and the 60s. It was the way an awful lot of people in the area made a few bob. My mother started off in Mary Street selling for her mother, uh, apples and oranges outside the Mary Street cinema. And then she married my father and his mother was in the fish business. So she went into the fish business. So eventually she got a stall in North Street. And we're there ever since. Well, my mother was a trader. She was trading before uh, she was married, I think, with, with, with her, her own mother. And got to the big events, um, Crow Park or Tolka Park or whatever big events, even down the country. So she'd get her stuff from the fruit market. And she obviously knew a lot of people around the area. My mummy went out to sell newspapers then, you see. And I sold newspapers before I made me communion. And I smoked before I made me communion. I went to the races and I went to the matches of a Sunday. You know, we went to everywhere of a Sunday. It has its tradition from Mickham's House and Church Street, Coleraine Street, Broadstone Constitution, Lurgan Street, where women were street traders and they had the prams and they were up early in the morning. They were down at the market. They went uptown to try and sell, to make ends meet, to put food on the table. And that was always there. We used to, we used to walk up then up to Manor Street, up, up to Prussia Street, up to then up to Handlin's Corner. And you'd always sell papers on the cattle market days and beyond. And the cattle would be sold. And they were very, they had to do a good day like that, you say, over there. So instead of giving three halfpence for the paper, they used to give two tuppence for the paper. And they wouldn't wait for the halfpenny change, which was fabulous, you know. So there you go, it was all money making. While the future of the fruit and vegetable market and Moore Street is uncertain, Smithfield and the surrounding area have seen major changes as a result of recent developments. From the 1960s onwards, inner city areas in Dublin went into terminal decline. This happened for a number of reasons, including the collapse of traditional industry and the relocation of people and businesses to the suburbs. By the turn of the century, new laws made it compulsory for developers to dig up the past before reconstructing the future. Most of my work has had to do with pre-development construction projects and in the case of Smithfield the, the whole site to the west of Smithfield Plaza um, was bought for development in around 2000 and we were brought in to excavate the site before construction started. Any sites that come up for um, development within a certain zone they generally have a planning condition which says that the site has to be ex excavated when the site in Iron Key was dug in 1990, it was, it was dug in advance of the development of the site as, I think it was initially meant to be an office building, but then it changed to actually build apartments. Well, this part of Dublin was always known as Oxman Town, and Oxman Town relates to the, to the uh, Vikings who were um, ethnically cleansed, I suppose, from the south side after the Battle of Clontarf. Now, what is little enough um, historical evidence for that, there's certainly quite a lot of archaeological evidence the, the north side of the Liffey didn't, doesn't seem to have developed really until the 11th century, what we can see. The reason it seems to have developed initially is the, the existence, firstly, of the Fort of the Hurdles, later the bridge. The only bridge in medieval Dublin was the one there at Church Street. Well, St. Mickens is the earliest church here, and St. Mickens was a parish church for the Viking parish. So that's a very early foundation. Firstly we get St. Mickens and then we, you get St. Mary's Abbey, which was huge. It was one of the biggest and most important abbeys in Ireland, one of the richest. If you look at any, any towns where anywhere you get an abbey, a big abbey like that, they would attract, they would attract markets because they, uh, they would have been like, they were basically landlords. They owned huge amounts of land. So anything sold, bought, the tax on those would go to the abbey. and it had extensive lands which really extended around what today are O'Connell Street and Marble Street, extending right out as far as Santry. And of course they also had extensive fisheries along the river. Well there would be markets in the area extending back at least as far as the foundation of the Abbey, circa 1200, and it's quite likely that there were markets in the neighbourhood before that again as the area was the central Viking suburb. The markets area, along with large parts of the north and south inner city, had some of the worst slums in Europe by the end of the 19th and early 20th century. When 
Tuesday the 2nd of September 1913, two tenement houses on Church Street collapsed, killing seven people, including three children. This disaster and the inquiry that followed set in motion a long and slow process of slum clearance. It also marks the beginning of the provision of public housing by Dublin Corporation for the people of the city. The first of these type of projects was completed in the Church Street area in 1916. This was one of the houses that were built in response to the collapse of the houses, the tenement houses in 1913. Uh, my grandparents moved in here with my mother and her siblings in 1916, I believe, and never moved out. And from that then, she reared ten children. It was me, mother, my father, my grandfather, and five brothers, four sisters, and myself. When these houses were built, a lot of the people from the tenements in the area uh, moved into the houses. There are two up, one down, with a scullery. Um, that's the extent of the houses. Having said that, if you were living in a one-room tenement and had to share a toilet with maybe, you know, 60, 70 other people, you know, there was a, they were luxury, I suppose, when people moved into the forest. I was brought up here in the 40s, I was born in the 1940s, so it was through the 40s. We moved from here, I think it was in 55, so I was 15 by the time. And then I went, I went up Navin Road and then moved to England a few months after that. So mo most of my childhood was around Ormond Square, where I lived. This particular building was four flats for four families. I think they've changed into two families now, so it was pretty crowded. I mean, when you're a kid, you don't realise how tough times are. Um, so you don't, know, you don't know any different anyway. But it was pretty tough, I think, for a lot of people. There wasn't a lot of employment, a lot of unemployment, uh, actually, in those days. I think a lot of people from the area did work in the, whether it be the fish market or the fruit market. Um, but it was a bit, of a, a bit of a scramble, I think, all the time to get jobs, so people, weren't well off by any means, but it was a good community uh, because people had to help each other and, and, and that's what they did. We only lived in one tenement room off the top of a, a tenement house. And I mean, say she had uh, 11 children. It was nowhere for the Germans to bleed. That's what my mother used to say, say, oh, thank God and his holy blessed mother, none of this was ever really sick. Because there was nowhere for the Germans to bleed. Because I told you it was 11 girls in Mumbai in one tenement room. I mean, mother and father was talking of us in the tenement room, and the tide was four flights of stairs down. So you always had to have your, I won't say it, you had to have a bucket. You know, you know yourself. And uh, we were never sick. The Germans wouldn't bleed. But remember, we used to say the Germans, but it was the Germans. And there was one, two, I think three tenement houses, um, which I lived in one of them. And there would be one, two, three, four, five families in that, uh, with no lights in the hall. Uh, no heat in the course, no power points, um, cooked on the fire. But the poverty was quite evident. I mean, it was nothing to see kids with sort of cardboard in their shoes. Um, it, was, it was quite evident. Um, and, you know, to see mothers and women struggle and go out early in the mornings. There was a lot of sickness then, there was a lot of TB. There was tough times because uh, I remember when I had to, you would get your stuff off the stalls. Like they used to have the daisy market up beside the fruit market and people used to get their clothes there or you get hand-me-down clothes. But some of the youth nowadays wouldn't understand if you explain that to them. They think you're living in a time war. There's ten of us in the family. There's seven boys, three girls. The mother and father. There was two rooms. One was used for the sitting room, the kitchen, everything. And the back room was the bedroom. When you went in the hallway, I was in stone, it was always cold. People just lived in two rooms at one time, the sink out in the land and they're down in the yard. And everybody was poor, but I don't think anybody thought of themselves, not the way they do nowadays, being poor. Like nobody had cars or anything like that. There was two rooms, a front room and you had a bedroom in the back and a little kitchen and a bathroom with a sink and a toilet. You'd know bath or shower. So there was, used to say, five kids in the back bedroom. And my mum and dad in the sitting room, they did a double bed. And they had a cot for the and a pram, like a big silver cross pram for the two, the two youngest kids. I got elected first in 1979. And at that time, you still had all the, um, the old, what were referred to locally as the tenements, the old Georgian buildings where huge numbers of people lived in 
you know, very few facilities in that. You you'd, you'd all the other flats complexes that had been built in the thirties, with no washing facilities, none at all. A sink, and you can't get into a sink to wash yourself. You know, so so you did you appalling living conditions, still into the late seventies and eighties, and uh, it, one of the lesser known elements in the. The program I had with the government that I supported in 1982 was that they provide washing facilities for people in flats complexes, not just in the north inner city, but people anywhere in flats complexes that didn't have them. And the, the reason that was in it was because a group of women from Liberty House down at the back of Sean McDermott Street asked me to get it in it because it was one of their, their main demands at the time. They used to have to go down the road to the Belvedere Youth Club to wash themselves. The importance of the fish market to the area has begun to fade from memory since it was demolished in 2004 to make way for a proposed redevelopment of apartments and shops. The story of why this market was located here goes back to the early life of the city as it developed along both sides of the River Liffey. We know on the north side as well of the river there's a whole lot of medieval ordinances that say you can't land fish on the south side of the river. You cannot eviscerate, as they call it, I mean, gut the fish. On the, on the south side you have to go to the north side of the river. And we have found areas at Aaron Key where we have huge amounts of fish, just the fish heads and the tails. They were dry, air drying them like they do today in Norway. They, that was a big activity on the north side of the river too, was the actual landing of fish. Well, where we're actually standing now at the moment, we're sta standing where the weighing scales were for people that come in and bought fish and go weigh it. And you're we're right in the middle of the fish market. And directly behind us would be the flat. So in its prime, they would have had a lot of, uh, lot of workers in here. They were getting big and they went to the fish market and learned their trade filleting until they were 21. They had to go for, from 14 to 21. So learning their trade filleting. Three of them went. My granny sold on Mary Street. So she used to sell fish. She sold exactly outside Jonas Butchers. There could have been a hundred traders that time. But they sold out the boxes. They hadn't got stalls. They sold out the fish boxes. They used to go to the fish market, bring up the fish, and they sold straight out of the fish boxes what they bought the fish in from the market. My mum was down in Morsley and each and every one of the family, and there was eight of us, we always took her in turns, no matter who it was, to bring her down a cup of tea. Sometimes if I went down to my mum, hold me gone, we'd go around and have that dinner, and I'd stand at the stand, and my mum would say to me, Mark, will you wait there for about five minutes, ten minutes? Go for half an hour, then I'd go for an hour. I've been there ever since, 44 years after, I'm still in Morsley. Growing up today in the markets area is very different from the past, when children spend a lot more time out of doors, creating their own games and play. In the markets area, the street was the playground. There was always a hustle and bustle around the place because the, the lorries would be coming in and you know, because it's a pretty crowded area anyway, you know, it's not, not that much space. But as kids we would obviously pass up through the markets, I had to talk through, through the markets, I'd run up even to George's Hill. And we'd obviously go into the market sometime maybe nick an apple or something on the, on the wires, or sometimes the, the traders would, would give, you, give you an apple or, or that, you know. Back then, Jesus, we were really, really innocent, you know. I mean, you had your friends that you played with. It was kind of seasonal as well, you know, you'd play piggy in the summer. Uh, the land host you'd swing on, you know, or skip in the street. In the winter, you know, we did have a bit of snow or ice. We used to make a slide down the middle of the square. Come out of school, go over to the handball alley, um, Played around home for tea. Went to the Phoenix Park a fair bit also, uh, and in and around Broadstone and the Temple, uh, the, the 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 top of Henrietta Street. You know, there was rumours that the statues there would move if you looked at them long enough. Spin the bottle was great. That was a great game. Spin the bottle. Cause we used to sit down, we get a poke the bottle. We, was, we were smothered in pubs all around. I mean, somebody get a bottle and you play spin the bottle. That was another fabulous game. That's where you, the bottle points here and here, and there was always a 
row of boys down, row of girls here, and that was a lovely game. But that's as far as we went now, and they weren't French kisses either, just normal Dublin kisses, you know, like that. We used to play the mel. You ever play the mel? Remember the mel? We used to throw a penny or anything, and whoever would get it up to the, would say up to this, like get it up to that, he'd win. The mel, and there'd be slaughter over the mel. Oh, there'd be slaughter. There were lots of pals around here, and we could play football up and down this particular area. And then somebody come out and moved us, and then we'd go over to that side of the square, and then over to that side of the square too. But it was mostly football. I had a ball, and I lived in the square. If some lads didn't live in the square, I'd just look after the ball. Like most of the football people that I know, players, all came from working class areas. And we played on the street first, and then uh, we obviously we wanted to play in a team, and we formed, formed our own team around the square called St. Columbus, which was in the Sodality League and uh, you had to join the Sodality before you could play in the, in the league. We played on the Sunday morning. That was the start. Well, there was always dance skills. We used to play down all uh, in, actually on the steps next door to where I lived. That we'd sit on top of the steps playing down all day long, you know what I mean? As children, the, the best way to learn your songs was to play cards. You know, we all played cards after the school days, you know. So we were all great at making up, you know, adding up which were all great and mostly, you know, it did, it did help. It was a lesson to be learned. I used to go with Mayo every morning. Me and Mayo went every morning to school at quarter to nine, and we'd go through the markers. But we used to have a teacher, with us, a nun, and as all she'd say is, uh, clean your teeth. So we had the brush to clean our teeth. At that time, people... People... <laughs> Uh, oh, have your teeth clean. Oh, we just have to get so we got a brush down to be clean. Oh, they're still clean. <laughs> she was both teeth and all, and she was telling us to clean it. <laughs> yeah, I remember going to school. It was a, like most kids, it was a big shock, you know, because you're playing around and you're going to go as far as something when I went to George's Hill and you're in the classroom and you know, Sister Agnes and you know, there were the sisters in those days. and. Uh, I never liked it. <laughs> I just wanted to get out and play ball. I couldn't wait for it to wait for it to finish. My grandfather would bring me up to school and be crying at the door. He was my pal, you know. And... Well, it was supposed to be in school till you were 14, like, but at 13, we were taking him uh, to go and get work. But I was taking it, but I loved school. I really loved it. I hated school. My mother used to be, when she'd be wanting to bring me, I'd be holding onto the railings and using any excuse, screaming at the go. In them days, you were terrorised, I felt. I went to uh, the Christian Bullers in, uh, in Brunswick Street. At the time, they were still, there, was a lot, there was still corporate punishment, and I, was, um, I used to, I'd left using my left hand quite a lot. So that was, it was beaten out of me. Um, and I left when I was 15, I couldn't wait to get out of the place. <laughs> I remember when the nuns, you know, when you'd be as a kid, not doing too well. And this particular nun, Mother Columbus, used to bring you in on a Saturday morning, especially when you're doing your primary cert. You know, and she'd say to you, when you weren't doing your best, and she'd get her knuckle, you'll end up choking the chickens and cottons. <laughs> no, a lot of us did. <laughs> well, I went to school and I left school at 14 years of age and I went to work after school. I used to make guitar strings. And then I left there then, we were, my, myself and my three sisters, we were in the sewing business, the dressmakers. In East Darren Street and down in Henry Street and Abbey Street and Mary's Abbey and Little Strand Street and all, there was all little sewing factories. And you would never, you, you would go, you could leave one job on a Friday and start another one on Monday. You, you, you'd always get a job somewhere at the sewing and there was always plenty of them around. I was nearly 15 when my man, my dad's sister, got me a job in Ireland at the short factory part. I used to have to make devil early shorts at the time. They used to get his shorts made, his tunic shorts, you know? You know, I'd have to overlock them down the sides and all, you know, and maybe make the cuffs, you know, I used to wear them big cuffs with the six holes in them, you know, that. Yeah, I used to do his shorts. I could always say I make devil early shorts. <laughs> My uncles used to stand on the quay waiting on the trucks to come up from the country. They would hurl a brester. Brester at the time was someone who would load a truck and unload a truck, and they'd get paid by the day. And then years later, I took up the same position at 15, 
in the fruit market. That's where we used to all stand then when people needed help for the trucks, you know. 53 it was when I started, and I was 16 then. But from those Street, we were shifted down into Mare Street. Uh, outside McDonald's Butchers, my mammy got a spot. I went over to sell on the opposite side of the street from my mother in law. Well, it was my pal, Carmel Mooney was my pal. I ended up marrying her brother. He was gorgeous, big, big fine, big fella. Grey hair like Jeff Chandler, was he was there. Uh, every bit as, as good as John Wayne, if you understand me. But then um, I ended up marrying him and s selling there, and I'm still selling there when I start. As the city grows, the memory of how people lived changes and becomes more faint and is often lost over time. One of the ironies of the recent building boom is that it wiped out so much of our visible past. However, with it came a boom in archaeological digs and the opportunity of learning more of how people lived in the distant past. Perhaps one of the more interesting things about the Smithfield excavation was at the very, very lowest levels we had extensive archaeological evidence for there being quite a substantial market on the site, which predated you know, the market we all know today. It's also interesting to note that the site was also the site of a gallows, and within the same surface at the market, where the market was taking place, we found uh, the remains of 27 bodies, 27 skeletons. So the, it was a very interesting collection of skeletons insofar as a couple of them may have actually have been priests who were executed because of their religion. Bishop of Devon was, was executed at the, end of the, um, at the end of the 16th century. The evidence of probability suggests that he was actually hanged on Smithfield. We found, we found a very good range of medieval material and post medieval material. Because the site is waterlogged, it's still at, at the bottom where we were digging, where the tide still came in twice a day. We were underwater twice a day. And the site's always been wet, so organic material, things like leather and wood and bone, was absolutely perfectly preserved. We've leather shoes, belts, lots of buckles, um, a good range of everyday material that people would have worn. We found one lovely gold finger ring that had Jesu Nazarenus Rex, Jesus King of the Jews, inscribed on it. It's, it's early 14th century. The markets area had a number of key employers over the years. Along with the fruit, vegetable, fish and livestock markets, there was also Korean soap company. Jameson's Distillery, Maguire and Patterson Match Factory, and lots of small sewing factories. Despite this, there were never enough jobs and unemployment was always a problem. In the last 40 years, nearly all traditional industry closed or moved from the area. There was a lot of unemployment. A lot of the lads went away, a lot of friends, my friends went to England then, and just basically that was it. They just went to England and just as general labourers, you know, some of them turned out very well. And done well for themselves but there was no work like once you were 16 you were out of a job you had a choice. I was lucky in the sense that I got into serve me time as a mechanic. There was eight of us and my daddy worked on the building and we had to go to England we couldn't get work. And my mummy would be waiting on the, the, uh, the telegram to call and the Friday sad and I might come to Monday and she'd be waiting on us. We used to go out and help me ma. We lived in Grammy Place in the ship. We'd bring her over a can of tea. We had a, uh, a nanta berries used to live with us. And she used to keep, it, keep us when we mammy be her. She looked after us. And she'd make a can of tea, fry bread, and we'd bring it over to Moore Street to me ma. You know, when you go back to Moore Street, years ago, there was no um, supermarkets. We had no supermarkets. We only had uh, Moore Street, which was the biggest outdoor market. People came to Moore Street now. Then, as I said, we sold cheaper than the shops. People couldn't afford to go to shops. They say the like of Grafton Street and, the, and there's no supermarkets. I remember I went down to my friend that sold in Moore Street and she asked me if they had given her help, they would understand it. So I used to go down in the mountains and do a bit of selling for her. That's how I got to know about selling. So it was really tough, and especially when it rained. So when it rained. We'd have to stand it whether we liked it or not. Once we bought that stuff, we had to get rid of it. Yeah, there wasn't work available, uh, you know, uh, in the docks or wherever. Uh, I won't say where you go to find the men, but 
Uh, it was the women that were out doing the work and that's pretty obvious in Moor Street. A lot of people around the area walked in the markets. Nearly every second house around had a stall in the market, something to do with the market. A lot of the men were labourers in the markets and a few of them had their own stalls and things like that. But the markets kind of deteriorated. I think when the supermarkets came in, the docks itself changed dramatically because they began to modernise. That meant that you didn't need what my father was doing, you had a forklift to do what he was doing. But with mechanisation, with containerization, all of that went. Uh, as, as the years progressed, I issues like unemployment became even more acute. And the same happened uh, in the markets area, in, in, in the, the fish market, in the fruit and veg market. It was all manual labour. There was huge employment provided. But once mechanisation came in, a lot of that changed. At the very least, the traditional sources of employment for local people were, were gradually disappearing and nothing was being put in its place. You know, when we joined the EU, that would have done away with all of the clothing industry because there was cheap imports coming in from the other EU countries. So the clothing industry actually kind of really died out over a couple of years very, very quickly. McGuire and Patterson's closed down, Jemison's moved. So all of the traditional, a lot of the tra traditional industries moved out. Me and my husband went over to England, and then we came back here. And we got a, a room over on the keys, and out of the room on the keys, we got a house out in Fingers. You know, then the, 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 the council and that started moving out, you know, moving the, the population out, that they were living out you know, Blanchestown, Finglas, all of them areas. Up to then, it was generations lived in the community. And I couldn't stick the house in Finglas. I wasn't happy now I got back to Green Street. Because you miss the markets and you miss the hustle and bustle and you're in the house and you're sitting looking at the four walls after cleaning the house, you know what I mean? Uh, they started knocking down. The first place I remember being knocked down around was Coleman's. The, they used to make sacks and ropes and things like that. And that closed down and that's where they built the tax office at that corner. But then they start knocking down buildings and not putting anything on them. So we had a good few derelict sites around. From, from 60 on with the slum clearance, when they early went into a period of stagnation. Bear in mind there was, no, there, and still is no anti-speculation laws. Uh, so people, property owners, sat on the property and there was no uh, obligation on them to to rebuild or, or regenerate. So it went the area overall went into decline. Smithfield was derelict for a long time and a lot of the, lot of the yards was just bought up and just lay there and just time stood still and there was nothing happening. And eventually they were all sold to this to what we have now, this big development. There are two important features of the markets area that give it much of its shape and look, even up to today. The first is the quays, which were built on reclaimed land along the River Liffey. This process took hundreds of years and was finally finished by the middle of the 18th century. This allowed for the type of building we now see along the quays and the space to build one of Dublin's landmark buildings, the Forecourts, which was finished in 1802. The second important expansion of the area took place at the market area of Smithfield, which was first developed in the 1660s. The new suburb of Smithfield kept its markets and through the centuries they dominated life and business in the area. It was not until the late 1950s that the influence of the markets began to seriously decline. A process of official neglect and decay took hold and developed into the gloom and dereliction of the 1980s. Increasing unemployment for men in the, in, the, in the docks and the markets and so on, the emphasis turned to women uh, and, and the traditional way of earning money and in a serious growth and sell. I left school when I was, I think I was in second year and I just didn't like school anymore, I just wanted to live because I could see my man struggling and my dad wasn't working down at that time so 
My older sister Tracy, she left school to go out and sell them to help me marry every day. So I asked him, why could I do the same? So I was old enough to leave school and I did. After a while I wasn't with my husband, right? So the wrong time he sent me no money for a while. So I got a pram and went down like went down to America. And any girl knew in America and she got me a few tomatoes. So I went down like sold the tomatoes, right? Got a few bob. So I started that way. So I just kept going down the market and getting a bit of stuff and going out. There was that and brought in and locked up in the station over there. Seven o'clock in the morning and before that, women out with prams heading down to the market to buy wherever was going. They came back and the, the pram, the breadboard on the pram and the bananas on the breadboard and they sold from that. That was their stall. They were selling on the streets of their city. I mean, this was, this was a tradition. This was Molly Malone, you know. It was grim and it was in recession, bad times. Then you had the street traders where they were selling uh, fruit and veg and Valentine cards, maybe, or Christmas cards uh, in town. And the business association took great exception to this and they contacted the Gardaí. And the Gardaí had what was called snatch squads. And what was actually happening to those women was that they were being hauled off the court strange as it may seem, and they were being jailed. I remember I was taken one time, I went down with me a bit of stuff, I think it was apples or something, or whatever I had, and I'm walking there next to this pulled and uh, I'm on Store Street. Anyway, I went down to Store Street and I was locked in the cell. So it was that's a terrible load when he was sending a bit of flu at the time, you know. I was locked in the cell, the police never got all about me, and never came back for me to let me out, you know. So I'm in the cell, I'm sweating, I mean, I, as a matter of fact, I got claustrophobia over that, over, over that. And when he did come in, I pulled the cap and all off the man, oh, and he said, well, what do you leave me in here for? He said, yeah, I've got all of it, but he was home, and now he had to come back to get me in. They would arrest them, and under the Commissioner's Garda Act, they would confiscate their vegetables or their carrots or whatever, and then they would find them. So as a result of the fines, there was always word and sound for the women. So every time they saw the cops, they had to run. Well, the shops used to ring up, and when the police would come in, we had to come out there, you know what I mean? So you were taped, you were arrested and brought in, you know? If they caught you. There was one particular police man there that you'd have to really watch, because he was like a madman. He'd fly out of nowhere and just grab you like, and take you and bring you down to Star Street and keep you there down for the whole day, you know? They take the stuff on us and then we'd lose out like I'm buying that, you know. So uh, they used to chase us everywhere. But there'd be a gang of us, right, about ten of us maybe down south. And uh, we are the banner come next to be here, then ah neck be a big scatter. I think I used to be always the first up the top of the street. Uh, they'd be searched, they'd be stopped, they'd be in prison, they'd be in Star Street, they'd be in Fitzgibbon Street. Uh, myself and other public representatives spend our whole time going to the courts, to the guard stations and said it's all very well for you coming in here, Mr. Gregory, but uh, there are more influential interests on the phone to me. There's letters in the tray, and they showed them to me from business associations and so on. And he said, I have to implement the law. And I said, well, sure, I've been on to you uh, on numerous occasions about heroin being sold on the footpath in public all around your station there. And uh, you don't seem to be deploying the same resources to deal with that. And of course we had the epidemic and the scourge of heroin. Uh, so dealers focused on this area, saw how vulnerable it was and decided to move. So you had all of that going on. Uh, and you had a Fianna Fáil government in at the time, then you had a coalition. Nobody was listening to us. We, were, we weren't educated, we didn't understand, we didn't know anything about drugs or anything like that. So a couple of the residents, they went on um, committees to learn more about it. And we held, in the inner city, we held marches and went around like that. We had one or two very undesirable drug dealers in the square. So we set out and we got rid of them. It was only when the community stood up uh, to the drug dealers, and then mainly the women, who were the backbone of marching on dealers trying to do something about the heroin epidemic that was in that country. You know, not a lot of my friends now. Like, not really the girls, a couple of the girls, like, and 
some of the young fellas that hung around me, you know, got into it, you know, big time. A couple of them is actually dead. You know, it's sad. Heroin was being sold. Kids were wrecking their lives uh, with it. Little or no, no police resources were being directed against it. And at the same time, they were beginning this concerted attempt to destroy the one livelihood that a lot of the families had in the city. No action appeared to be taken and the concentration was on the women, their prams and their bits of property. And the women had taken enough and they went down uh, to pick it outside the GPO. The trial began after Gardaí made two arrests in Henry Street for breaches of the Illegal Street Trading Act. Other traders made their way to Lower O'Connell Street and blocked cars. Traffic was brought to a standstill and extra guard they were called from nearby stations. The traders refused to move and confrontations followed. There, there was a baton charge and there, the women resisted. We were arrested except Tony Gregory and a few of the women. I remember we were put into a van, but we were coming up on Connell Street and um, the van doors got booted open. Uh, and myself and Gregory jumped, ran. I got caught, he got away. He was arrested again an hour later. Uh, but we were brought before the courts and we were sentenced. I think we'd done a month and then we did two weeks. Uh, and a number of the street traders was arrested with us. What was happening to us? had been happening to women for a couple of years before that. The district courtroom was crowded for the short hearing. Mr Gregory and Joe Costello of the Prisoners' Rights Association were both charged with assault and obstruction. Sinn Féin councillor Christy Burke was charged with insulting and threatening behaviour. Four casual street traders were also before the court. After the hearing, Deputy Gregory addressed the crowd. You have a constitutional right to, to earn a living to rear your families and to provide for your families. And if we have to take a constitutional case to win this issue, we'll do it. So we're gonna take it to right to the bitter end. Now in the meantime, they got Tony Gregory and Tony was speaking up for us, you know what I mean? So he was locked up in main jail. In our case, it wasn't any big deal for a woman who's the main source of an income for a family to be up in Mount Joy for a couple of weeks is no joke. And it was, no, it was no joke for the women street traders. And then when they went to Mount Joy, then there was protests and meetings and it was all, all organised, you know, to get the girls out. So we all got our prams and we all marched up to Mount Joy. We were all marching up and down with pickets. <laughs> My road and all, the whole lot of us. With black cards and all up and down Mount Joy, you know. Release Tony Gregory. The living disgrace, that such a good man should be put inside Mount Joy. We want Tony out. After all, the put, put, the put, it's not in. He's in for rights for us and we want them out. We don't uh, think he should be in there at all because he's no up. way a criminal. People around the country were horrified. They couldn't believe this was going on. Um, and that gave it, th that forced, that, uh, probably more than anything else, the business crowd to back off to some degree and the city council to get a bit of cop on and, and to try and resolve the problem instead of making it worse. After we came out of prison, we began to get some recognition by the city council where we could regularise areas like Coles Lane, the back of the Oilac, parts of O'Connell Street where there's two stands now, and I think there was a couple in Marlborough Street and a couple of stalls on the bridge of the O'Connell Bridge. And it began to calm down a bit. Now my husband and his family sold in Henry Street and when I got married I sold in Henry Street. Now Christmas, if a Christmas for a month, uh, 74 licenses for this. Still, we're still in Henry Street. But then we got moved, I, I sold outside of Ireland. And then they moved us, they moved us to, uh, moved some of to Marks and Spencer's. While the conflict of the 1980s has died down, the dispute between the City Council and Business Association on the one side and the women street traders on the other rumbles on over rights and regulations year after year. I was 25 years on Dublin City Council and the longest running thing, issue, 
that I was involved in was that whole thing of street trading. Every year there were attempts to reduce and reduce the number of, of, of stall business class in the Henry Street area didn't want them outside their shops and were constantly putting pressure on City Hall to get rid of them. Any income that was to be made, they wanted to make it. They didn't want anybody else sharing them. They didn't give a damn that these women happened to live up the road and they, they themselves lived in God knows where, but certainly wasn't in Greek Street or Sean McDermott Street or Summer Hill or anywhere else. The late 1980s saw new government policies to revive inner city areas. Investors were encouraged with generous tax incentives to redevelop large parts of central Dublin. The seeds of the boom and recent bust were sown. Early large scale developments at the Custom House Docks and Temple Bar were thought to be too much in favour of commercial interests. A new approach for redeveloping the city was adopted called Integrated Area Plans. The first of these plans was set up in the markets area. It was called the Historic Area Rejuvenation Project, or HARP for short. Funding for these plans came from the EU and were based on local community involvement at every stage of redevelopment. Like it's positive and negative. Uh, there's a lot of positive to the regeneration of the area, but one of the drawbacks is that there's not enough interaction between the old and the new communities. Which this area was supposed to be regenerated through its people and through through its through the arts um, and through education. We were promised so much in the in this development and it was never delivered. It was presented on a plate to the developer. While HARP delivered some benefits for the area, it failed to ensure adequate social and affordable housing for local people whose families had lived in the area for generations. They were bought up by investors. Prices rocketed. Local people couldn't afford to buy them. And it means that we have a transient population and our own children cannot afford to live in the area that they want to live in. This uh, was sold for eight and a half million and we're in a week at made a hundred million. You know, there's massive pro turnover in, in, in terms of profits in developments like this. There are many lessons to be learned from past developments in the city. Primarily that the existing community needs should be prioritised to ensure that any community gain would be substantial and long term and to the benefit of people living in the markets area. Yeah, today, with the big developments that are just going through the planning process at the moment, there's a real threat against the traditional uh, stalls in the Moor Street area. Those big business don't see a role for people from the local communities to share in whatever income can be, can be gained in that area. There's a few people even voluntarily out the street. I've been asked to leave out the street voluntarily and I get a dividend. But see, I'm not going to leave, so I'm only 72 years of age and God has had to give me health and strength. I'll stay walking. Until, maybe when I'm 82, I might consider. Well, I tell you, I was 26 when I'd done that first bit of selling with Sally McGuire's mother. Made a pity man, and she was a dealer down in Moor Street, and she gave me the bit of stuff to go out into the Henry Street. I went out, that's the first time I went out selling. Well, that was in 19, 1958, so I only packed it in two years ago. That's all. I'm 77 now, and I packed it up when I was 75. Somebody somewhere needs to listen to the street traders, and particularly the women who have served this country well. And, 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 and pay their way in society and were let down by the state. Sit with them, draw up plans, move forward and stop putting obstacles in the shagging way to try and oust what's a culture and a tradition and it will never go away. Never go away. It'll always be there. Uh, there's a lot of talk that they don't want us in Moor Street. We're not wanted. Then you have them saying, oh, they do want us. If you didn't have Moor Street traders, you wouldn't have the, the influx of people coming into the city centre. Because most people are coming in to get bargains and they do get them in Moor Street. And Moor Street is the heart and soul of Dublin. So if you take the street traders out of uh, Moor Street, you're, taking, you're ripping the heart out of Ireland, let's face it. They've been there long before me 
and hopefully they will be there long after I'm gone.